Yes. Welcome to Voice of Supply Chain brought to you by ISM New Jersey uh, and the fabulous Kathy Perna, who we've been working together now. This is our fourth year hosting the show. We have kind of our, our regular followers and crew who have continuously asked to, to have us continue the show. So we decided we'll bring it back for a fourth year. The purpose of our show is to tell the personal stories of people in supply chain and procurement doing extraordinary things. I am the show host, Sarah Scudder, Marketing Maven. I uh, ended my time with Source Day in December, where I spent almost two and a half years running marketing for them. And I have actually picked up some fractional CMO clients in the procure tech space already, which has been really fun and exciting to get to work with different brands and help them with their go-to-market strategies. So going to continue doing that for a while as I figure out what Sarah Scudder 3.0 looks like. <laughs> For those that are joining us live, would love to have you drop us a note in the comments. Tell us where in the world you are joining us from today. And the biggest problem you are facing right now in your procurement organization. And I like to always ask a question so we can engage the audience. And I mm -hmm. may pull some of that and incorporate that in my questions to Jill today. So again, where in the world you're joining us from, biggest procurement pain point challenge you are experiencing right now within your organization. With that, I'm going to announce our guest, Jill. I have known Jill for probably five plus years, I want to say. I don't even actually remember how we first met, but we become LinkedIn friends, text message friends, um, hoping her and I get a chance to hang out in person this year at an industry mm -hmm. event or conference. But um, thanks for coming on today, Jill, and excited to hear a little bit more about your personal journey, which I actually don't know a lot about okay. myself. Yeah, great to, to be on. Thank you. I think we met, actually, it was over 10 years ago at a at a conference um, when we all used to, to go frequently, and you were doing print. Oh, it may have been, you know what, a ProcureCon, a conference. Yep. Yep. I was probably decked out in newspaper print when I was in the marketing <laughs> procurement space. <laughs> oh, yes. In true Sarah fashion. <laughs> um, so, Jill, I like to start off with, so again, the purpose is we're going to kind of walk through and, and share more of the, the personal Jill and the personal journey of how you got into this industry, some of the things you've accomplished and what you're doing now. And I like to go way back in time and start from childhood because I think some of that is really interesting and defines um, you know, who we are today. So let, let's put, put your thinking cap on, rewind way back in time, okay. and would like to have you start by talking about something in your childhood that shaped you to be the person that you are today? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, probably elementary school at some point, um, you know, just growing thick skin. Um, I was, you know, teased and kind of pushed around like a lot of kids are. Um, and I am grateful for it. Um, I, I think it shaped me into the person that I am. Um, I think a lot of people um, don't have thick skin um, these days and kind of just crawl into a ball and kind of woe is me. And um, I embraced it. It wasn't fun, but you know, most things in life that are worthwhile um, that make us who we are um, and that train us. And I, I mean, I know you're very disciplined, um, but you don't grow um, when you're not challenged. So I'd say that, you know, over time, and then I started, you know, throwing it back um, in, you know, various individuals' faces. And, you know, I was, I think it was maybe third, fourth grade. I mean, it was pretty early on. Um, and it was silly stuff on the playground. Um, and, you know, you remember some of those people from your childhood and, um, now, uh, I again, grateful for it. Um, and I think it shaped, you know, how I approached things from academics and sports and business. Um, because again, I just 
was able to overcome it and um, get beyond it. So I don't have children. My boyfriend has two girls actually in college. But one of the things that mm -hmm. when I think back to my childhood is we didn't have cell phones. Oh, no. <laughs> and I just it's shocking to me when I see, you know, small children using a cell phone, probably better than I know how to use. But I can't even imagine the bullying and things that go on this day and age with the presence of internet access 24 seven and yeah. what happens on social media. So in some sense, I feel like I'm kind of glad that I grew up in the dark ages, right. but I think that your experience would have been very, very different today had social media been a part of that. Oh, potentially. Yeah. I think it's evil. <laughs> I just, and I think people let it shape who they are rather than just turning it off and going and getting dirty and actually having face-to-face -face conversations. Um, that's my opinion. <laughs> Most influential person in your childhood and why? Um, most, my parents, um, you know, they were pretty strict and um, we were pretty strict. When you say pretty strict, let's define what, what does pretty strict mean? Um, there were boundaries and if we fell outside of those boundaries, the consequences, my dad used to say girls school, um, and disown from the family. <laughs> if we crossed certain boundaries, which I, I won't go into because it's, they're not politically correct. Um, so it, it you know, we, we understood what they were and, you know, kids will be kids. Of course, we always pushed things and got away with some things and didn't get away with other things. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, it was done out of love um, and it was done, you know, to hold us accountable. You know, we had responsibilities um, and I'm grateful for that. I was the oldest of four girls. My dad was royally outnumbered. Even our pets were female. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that I had it the hardest because I was the oldest. And I also yeah. grew up in a very, very strict family. And mm -hmm. you did not go against what my parents said. It was not an option. Yeah. And I feel like by the time my youngest sister, Anna, was in high school, it was a free for all and she could do yeah. absolutely anything and everything. But when I was in high school, things were very, very buttoned down and I wasn't able to do a lot. So yeah. I, I can relate. <laughs> so you have your own family now mm -hmm. you're married and and you have a son mm -hmm. what's one childhood tradition that you've continued on with your family today um you know i think just being together um at the holidays um you know at christmas we always go to christmas eve service um and, you know, I think it's important just to spend time together, downtime. We play games together. Um, my son does not have an iPad. Um, we play board games. Um, we go outside and shoot baskets. Um, it's, it's important for us. We, you know, throw the football in the backyard. Um, so we're very active and um, it's, it's fun. Um, so I guess he lives in the dark ages, which that's the best thing. <laughs> so I also come from a game family. We had a mm -hmm. cupboard filled with games and we yep. played games almost every day. Favorite mm -hmm. board game for the fam? Uh, board game. Um, we don't play a ton. I mean, we, we do a little Monopoly, but we don't do like quote unquote board. I mean, we he loves cover your assets. It's a card game. It's about kind of how you manage money and accumulate assets. We do dominoes. Um, so I guess trouble, if that you consider that a board game, he likes to play trouble. <laughs> Categories was the Scudder yeah. favorite growing up. Yeah. I think we destroyed several Scattergory games and had almost every the, the set of cards, them all memorized. So 
That was um, Monopoly was also another one of our faves and learning about real estate and part yeah. the park place and the green properties were always the, the, the fight in the family. Yeah. Fun. So in call or in high school, um, you decided that you were going to go to college. Mm -hmm. What did you in high school, what did you think you wanted to do when you grew up? Oh gosh. Um, I think it changed. Um, honestly, Sarah, I don't, I mean, some people kind of have, you know, kind of set dreams and, um, you know, at one point, I think before I, I went to college, um, I wanted to be like a psychologist or, you know, um, study, you know, interaction. And my dad's, he's very blunt and he's like, I'm not sending you and paying for school. Um, for you to not make money, you're going to go to school and get a degree where you can make money <laughs> and be independent and have freedom. Um, and, you know, that takes on many different shapes and forms for different people. Um, you know, I commend, you know, people for different disciplines and professions that they have. Um, but for me, you know, he knew me better than I knew myself, right? Our parents usually do when we're, we're younger. And um, so I got a business degree and I, I, I didn't know, you know, what I was going to do with that. Um, but I, again, knew I wanted to be financially independent and um, give back and, you know, uh, leverage my skills. So I got a business degree. So can absolutely relate. I, I don't even know. I'm 40 now. And mm -hmm. I, I still don't even know if I could tell you what I want to do, you know, yeah. five or 10 years from now. So I think that's a very hard question. Yeah. I thought I was going to go into the fashion industry. I, I mm -hmm. loved fashion and, and it's something that I, I just have enjoyed throughout my career. Same mm -hmm. though, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I also majored in business and figured business is safe. Yeah. Having a business degree will allow me to make money. And I yeah. cared a lot about being able to make enough money to always be, support myself and not ever have to depend on someone else. So I feel like business is a good yep. tried and true major. Um, if you don't know specifically kind of what your interests are, or what you plan to do later in life. Yeah, I agree. So you went to Indiana University. Mm -hmm. Don't know much about the school. Um, mm -hmm. Most important thing you learned while you were at Indiana University. Um, yeah, so in the Midwest, we call it IU. <laughs> um, so IU. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a Big Ten school. Um, I, you know, it, my dad went there. Um, I, I could have gone other places. I played golf in high school and I was offered some golf scholarships and um, I kind of got burned out and decided, you know, to take some time off. Um, I did play my last year though, um, in school, but, um, the most important thing I learned, I had a great, awesome professor, um, Dave Haberly, um, and he taught personal finance. He was not an academic. He had been in the business world. Um, and my best, uh, professors had real world experience and they were not academics. And he taught 18, 19 years old. He's like, start your Roth IRA now. He's like, I don't care if you have to steal money from your parents. He's like, you need to put the minimum in. Um, I started a Roth IRA when I was 18 years old. Um, and I worked. Um, I always I, I worked from the time I was 13, 14 years old. So I had the money to put in it. I didn't have to steal anything, <laughs> like he said, from my parents. But, you know, he just he taught us the basics in a way that made sense, um, not in an accounting way, um, not you know necessarily in a deep cash flows way. But hey, this is how money works. Here's the time value of money. Here is compound interest. You know, here are the things you know you need to do to be disciplined um, and to save because we all work for a reason. We work to not work someday. Um, so for me, it, it's living below your means, it's saving. Um, this is a means to another end. You wanna do a good job in everything you do. I have a very high um, work ethic and um, performance threshold um, for myself and you know others 
that surround me. But um, I think, you know, it translated and it resonated with me. I still have, I came up, we were cleaning out, we've been in our house 21 years now and we were cleaning out some stuff in our storage room in the basement. I still have um, the book from his class. So isn't it interesting, one, that a whole side note, which I won't go on a rant today about financial literacy in schools and how I think it should be taught starting yeah. in preschool. Mm -hmm. I, I am shocked by people that I went to college with that graduated and literally like knew nothing about finance or what a credit card means or how to manage a checkbook. So yeah. I think that's a huge, huge open space in our education system. And I hope that someday we see some improvements there, but goes to show the power of a professor. So yep. my favorite professor in college was Dr. Robert Eiler. Mm -hmm. I paid for, I, I got a minor in economics or double mm -hmm. major business yep. and economics. And I picked yep. up second degree just mm -hmm. because of him because I loved yeah. his classes so much and we're still good friends to this mm -hmm. day and I think about what an impact he's had on my life just yeah. from being an awesome human mm -hmm. and not being some crazy academic where I don't understand anything he says he brought real world experience yeah. into the classroom yeah. and that's why he was such a popular professor yep yeah, I agree yeah I mean and and I think too professors like him and like I had, I mean, making it real for people and talking to people at their level, you know, you don't need to, you know, talk at people, talk above people, um, because it doesn't help anyone. If I have to have Google or something pulled up to research every other word that they say or yeah. every acronym, right? not a fan. Yeah. Yeah. So you got your degree in business. Mm -hmm. You have this awesome professor that's helped you be super financially savvy and stable throughout your life, which is great. What did you think you were going to do after college? <laughs> Find a job. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, like I, I didn't know something in business. Um, and, you know, I got a job at um, an, a local airline, ATA, American Trans Air. They used to fly, you know, kind of like niche trips to, you know, cool destinations. And they had like a ambass, like a travel club and they would do some cool stuff. And I was a business analyst um, there and um, I graduated in, you know, early uh, <laughs> twenty. 2001. Um, and then 9-11 happened um, and that industry went kaput. I was at the airport um, when that happened. Um, it was very scary. Um, and weeks later, I was escorted to my car by armed security because 5,000 people were laid off. Um, so I was given a box and said, pack your things. And um, so, Welcome yeah. to the real world, right? A real kick yeah. in the pants. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, I, I, I rolled with it. Was I happy? No, but God has a plan. Usually we don't know about, and you know, it was probably the best thing. I had a really crappy boss there who was super petty. Um, but that was, you know, my first job out of school. Um, even though I'd had internships, whatever. Um, but you know, thinking at that age, you know, you got to go to the unemployment office. I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, but, you know, I had money saved. It wasn't I didn't have to really adjust too much. I, But the the job market was crap. Right. I mean, everybody was laying people off. Um, the economy was, you know, very uncertain at that time. Um, I think within a month, couple months, I then found a job at a large healthcare network in town. And I, um, you know, worked there for um, several months and I was in IT, but I was doing RFPs and I was doing SRM, um, which I at the time didn't know anything about, um, but I was good at it. I liked interacting with the internal stakeholders. Um, I loved negotiating with the suppliers. Um, and then uh, that company decided to outsource all of IT to a, a consulting firm. And I didn't really want to be a consultant. I didn't want to work 
80, 90 hours a week at that age. Um, so I found a job at Ingersoll Rand in strategic sourcing. So I kind of I dipped my toe, you know, in procurement strategic sourcing pretty young and early in my career, I'd say. Um, and then went to Ingersoll Rand and had a great boss who, you know, mentored me and coached me and really just said, run with it. And so I started analyzing spend and, um, you know, finding opportunities. Really, you're a detective <laughs> uh, when you're in those roles. And I encourage people, you know, early in their career in procurement to, you know, kind of take a generalist role, take a role in operations or, you know, just dissecting things because the the data tells you a story. Um, so I found a lot of, you know, fragmentation um, and I identified some opportunities um, while I was in that role. And I mean, I, I saved them millions of dollars just on like cell phones and telecom spend um, because they weren't optimizing contracts. They hadn't negotiated in a while. Um, so I was quickly promoted, you know, after that, um, I got the attention of the CFO and what, what was the, I think your official title was commodity manager mm -hmm. when you were hired. What was the most important thing that you did in that first role, kind of your first formal real role in procurement and sourcing? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, like I said, I think it was analyzing the spend and, you know, connecting the pieces um, and asking questions. And um, then, you know, I identified an opportunity um, and I was able to consolidate telecom spend. And um, so I had indirect. I mean, indirect back then, you know, was GNA, it was IT, it was marketing and sales. Um, and, you know, I was asked to negotiate a, an IT contract as well. And I would say that was probably the most impactful and like aha moment for me. Like, I, I think I negotiated an 80% savings from on a license deal um, from what they were asking. It was an Australian company. Um, and, you know, I worked in the division, which was safe, security and safety. Um, and, you know, I... I ask, you know, you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, so I learned again, very young. Um, so I'd say those two were the most um, impactful um, kind of, I mean, the 80% savings was impactful for me personally. It wasn't like a huge um, outlay of cash, but the consolidation of suppliers and spend and telecom, like, that's what got the attention of leadership and, um, oh, she really does know what she's doing and is good. Um, so it benefited me as well as them significantly. So you said something that I think is really important in that you had a great boss. Mm -hmm. What does a great boss look like in procurement? Yeah, um, you know, I think pr procurement oftentimes gets pigeonholed, I feel, Sarah, that, you know, people don't realize it's like, is it procurement? Is it strategic sourcing? Is it part of supply chain? So, you know, I think it depends on the industry. But what I will say is you have to be business savvy because you're interacting with the business and you're interacting with the marketplace and suppliers. So, you know, a, a good boss and, you know, in this space is coaching you to see the big picture, you know, connect the dots um, and, you know, challenging you to be better at what you do um, and playing to your strengths. Right. I mean, we all have different strengths, um, but, you know, there's no better seat in the house than procurement. But you have to use that seat and not just go so deep in your silos if you're supporting one spin category or you know, one business area, it's like, nope, take those blinders off, look across the business, you know, um, listen to if it's a publicly traded company, listen to your earnings calls, like know what's going on and, you know, where there are opportunities. 
So I remember my very first boss took a huge, huge risk on me, hired me actually when I was in college. Uh I started my career and spent a lot of my career in marketing procurement. So on the indirect side. And to this day, he is the best boss I've ever had in my career. Mm -hmm. And I think what made him so good is that he allowed me to fail Mm -hmm. and taught me how to learn from my failures very quickly Mm -hmm. and allowed me to be very creative and think differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit of a a quirky, more marketing type minded person. And so I don't do very well being put into a box and being told, do something this way or follow Mm -hmm. this exact process. And he allowed me the creativity to learn how to critically think and do things in a different way while still achieving an optimal end result. So if John Suey is listening, shout out to John Suey, best boss of my career. Um, You left Ingersoll Rand Mm -hmm. after a few years and you joined a company called Lilly and Co on the procurement team. Mm-hmm. One of the things that to me really stands out is you stayed at Lilly for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, that in my world coming mm-hmm. from startup, that's a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. So why did you choose to join Lilly? Let's start there. What was the big aha? Like, I want to leave my current job and move to a new company, join a new procurement team. Um. You know, I think looking for opportunity, um, it was a larger company. It was headquartered, you know, here in Indianapolis. Um, Someone that I had previously worked with at Ingersoll Rand had gone there. Um, So, you know, I think that's what kind of triggered me to go there and then to stay. um, You know, I worked in research and development and I worked in IT. So I got to see a lot of different um, areas of the business. Then I went to P2P um, and led a a team there. And, you know, at that time, that's when people were outsourcing, um, you know, their GBS, kind of their back office purchase to pay processes. Um, And and I was given I had great support, um, I think, outside the box. Um, and I, I constantly would put myself in the shoes of either the business or the stakeholders and like, you know, interacting with procurement in some of these companies back in the day was not easy navigating, getting requisitions and right. You know, knowing who approved suppliers or preferred suppliers are, um, so, you know, I, I, I would, would say it's still a bit of the wild, yeah. wild west on the indirect side, even in 2024, but back then probably more so. Yeah. And a lot more manual, but, um, you know, I think making it easy for like my kind of focus and passion was making it easy for the business to do the right thing and understanding, you know, where they were coming from, um, versus just kind of, okay, fill out this form, whatever. Um, so, you know, it, it was, it was fun. So I stayed because I had variety. Um, and I, you know, I saw opportunity. Um, there was, an endless, like in most conglomerate and large multinational companies, um, there's an endless array of opportunities. If, if you view, you know, obstacles and problem as, as opportunities, um, I'm a problem solver. Um, and you know, I, I don't think like an employee, I think like a business owner and how can we optimize this? How can we make it more efficient? How can we streamline? How can we eliminate? Um, So, you know, asking some kind of basic questions like that. Um, So that's that's why kind of in a nutshell, um, to answer your question, I I stayed. What would you call out as one of the most interesting projects you worked on while you were there? You did a lot of different things. But if there's something that really stands out as like, wow, I had a huge impact or I learned a ton from this project. Mm, one. <laughs> um, maybe probably negotiating with um, the medical health benefit provider and pharmacy benefit manager. I was in charge of all of GNA. Um, you know, I had a 
category lead. Um, but I mean, it was a significant spend because they covered retiree medical. So the number of insured um, that were on these plans um, was significant. The space was, I mean, I knew a little bit, but it is so complex. And I mean, it's a hornet's nest. And when you're working with HR, they think they've got everything covered. They didn't want, I mean, but, you know, it opened my eyes in so many ways, <laughs> um, kind of internally and externally, um, that, you know, thinking back, you know, you asking me the question, that was probably one of the the most, I mean, when we were able to achieve, you know, significant savings for the company, we, act, we had to hire an external consultant because it is just, it is such a complex space. Um, and there are so many, like, navigation and loopholes well, and things. Probably so many, like, legal things that you have to, you know, be up to date on as well, which oh. is hard if you're not a specific niche category expert. Well, it's legal, but it was pricing and, you know, access to formularies and play. Like, it was, it's very, it, it's a very interesting, like, space to um, get exposed to. And especially working with the expert i still am in contact with um the consultant that um helped us um the external consultant um and yeah so that was quite interesting um dealing with all of that so one of you've you mentioned it a couple times today but one of the things that stands out to me about your career is you have just constantly delivered cost savings. You just mm -hmm. mentioned it in some of the examples you gave, but if you look at your resume, if you look at your background, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a theme throughout. When I think mm -hmm. of Jill, I think of significant cost savings. How were you able to do that so successfully in so many different roles and throughout multiple companies? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so the remit, right? The old remit, um, I think the the new remit for procurement's a bit different, but the old remit was take out cost, right? Um, figure it out, find it. Um, and what I uncovered was, you know, something I mentioned earlier that so many people don't prepare, research, and then go into a negotiation with that information and data and you know knowing like past performance or future requirements so i was able to achieve the significant savings because i prepared i asked the tough questions and i'm very fair i mean i i still to this day work with many of the suppliers that i negotiated um as i sat on the other side of the table um but having you know the facts and data and doing it in a collaborative way um, is really key. Um, you can achieve unprecedented, you know, value savings, innovation, um, and improve you know the relationship going forward. So the the two can coexist. So many people you know think it's it's win lose. I don't believe that. Um, I think you really have to focus on. How do you make this a win-win? Because you get if you sign a contract, you shouldn't be signing a contract if you're losing. It has to be win-win for both parties. Otherwise, don't sign the contract. Um, so you know, I think that's really key. And you know, any savings or any relationship starts after the contract signed. Um, and you know, so many people think, oh, well, I got you know. I think sales is very misincentivized, in my opinion, because they're rewarded. When the deals no, you need to be rewarded. Did you achieve? Did you deliver everything that you committed to when you committed to that in the contract? Yeah, what comes to mind as you were saying that is the 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 need or the interest to be curious. Mm -hmm. I think that to me, when I think about people who are exceptional in our space, people who are just awesome. Mm -hmm leaders in supply chain in procurement, they're constantly curious. Yeah. And that makes them go and do a lot of research and come prepared based on what they've learned from all the research that they've mm -hmm. gathered. And I feel like that's something that I think about when I think of you is mm -hmm. Bill to me is very curious. Mm -hmm. Yep. Curious and, you know, 
just prepare too. And, um, and don't, a lot of times too, I, I feel like there's so much emotion. I mean, I've coached very large team. I mean, people, it seems like they get emotional by the hour of the day. It, it's not about emotion. I mean, and that's where the data, you know, you can be as curious if you want, but if you're emotional in a negotiation, you will suck um, and you will not get, even if you pre planned and you prepared and you wrote it, everything down, it's not going to work out for you. you so you have to, it, you have to play poker and check your emotions, you know, at the, at the door. Mm -hmm. So something else that stands out that you focused on at your 15 years at Lilly and Co. And I think this was kind of, again, another theme throughout your career was on what I call supply base rationalization mm -hmm. and supplier data quality and governments mm -hmm. governance. So um, maybe for those who are newer to the field, maybe you could explain what the, mm -hmm. that means and then how you were able to make such headway focusing on on that throughout your career as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, to your credit, you know, calling out the curiosity because asking the question and kind of digging deeper um, is kind of in my nature. So, you know, I started when I had access to data and, you know, some of my very early roles, I, I'm like, what is this telling me? What can we do with this? How do we, you know, become more efficient? And as I was in a lot of different groups um, at Lilly, you know, I touched a lot of different spend categories. I spent time in, you know, purchase to pay operations where you're seeing everything come through. Um, and, you know, I spent some time in um, business development doing, you know, financial modeling and asset valuations. And then I went into a six, Lean Six Sigma role and my Black Belt project was supplier data. Because when I was in my category roles and leading teams, I'm like, we have, you know, the same supplier in the supplier master 50 different times in different legal entities spelled different ways. Every time we would have to run like a spend analysis um, or find contracts, it was a holy nightmare. <laughs> um, and this is not different for, you know, a, again, a lot of um, multinational companies around the world, but it would grind my ax. I'm like, we have are too big and our suppliers know us better than we know ourselves. Um, and they leverage that. They know how to navigate. Um, they know who to talk to. They know that procurement, you know, the right hand's not talking to the left hand. Um, so that's really what triggered, um, you know, the focus on supply based rationalization, because usually the supplier master is overstated anyway, because of poor data quality. Then once you start looking at who you're actually working with and holding companies and, you know, parent child relationships and what they're actually doing for you. So getting the right attributes with that data um, is also key. It Then you can really start to manage your supply base proactively you understand where your money's going versus them who are selling to you um so it it opens up a lot more opportunity and more strategic dialogue um for strategic sourcing and procurement and jill in your experience is part of the goal to also identify who your key strategic suppliers are so you can prioritize mm -hmm. uh, putting a more um, collaborative program in place mm -hmm. versus having to spend time and resources with a company that maybe you spend $500 a year with. Yep. Yeah. It's all about being proactive and getting formal, you know, SRM in place. And, you know, that's going to look different by, you know, category, by company, by industry, um, but yeah, if you don't know where it's going or what you're getting for that, and it also links to, okay, how much spend do we have on contract? Are they performing to what they committed to? You know, do we have KPIs in place? How are we measuring those KPIs? So it's, it becomes then a snowball of higher relationship management, and then you take it to the next level, it's innovation. So, you know, 
as you move up the value chain, you know, how do we then not just deliver, but how do we innovate or co-innovate together? Mm -hmm. So moving along your career, I, I want to make sure we have time to talk about your entrepreneurship journey, which mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting for our audience. Mm -hmm. But to close out what I'm calling your corporate career, <laughs> you transitioned into a senior director role mm -hmm. at Alonco Animal Health. You were mm -hmm. there several years as well. Mm -hmm. And continuing on the theme of supplier relationship management and mm -hmm. cost savings, all of those you incorporated into your role there, what would you say was the most important project you worked on there and, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, so um, I sound like a, I feel like I'm a broken record, but really the data tells a story. Um, and every role I'm in, I always just dive into the data because it's uh, eye opening and it, it's gasping and it then allows you to really deliver value. Um, so in doing that, and we, so in my role, I sat legal kind of sat in the same vicinity as us. Um, and I started kind of digging into some data, um, was asked to sign off on, um, like, something from legal around a rebate for a customer. And that customer was also a supplier. And I'm like, okay, well, how are we connecting both sides of the equation? So we've got, you know, distributors and customers that are also supplying us goods and or services, right? On the other side. And oh, that's an interesting, us. that's an interesting yeah. mix. So <laughs> with that, I started asking some questions. Um, and eventually we were invited in to help kind of, we, it was called channel kind of the distribution team and train them on how to navigate procurement, um, because they were selling to procurement, essentially the products to be distributed then. Um, and you know, that was probably the most interesting, um, because we, that was true value chain connectivity and optimization. When you're connecting both ends, um, for me, it's exciting and it's valuable and you can see the fruits of your labor, right? Come full circle. Um, so kind of like one little conversation with legal, I'm like, what, why are we doing this? Like, what are we doing? Like, well, how are we negotiating over here? Are these people talking to each other? So just kind of, you know, being curious, you know, being patient, asking follow up questions and, and being persistent. Um, and, you know, we did quite a few trainings, um, you know, kind of developed some guidance and um, it was very beneficial. Hmm. Uh, the other thing that stands out to me in that role is that you managed a team of people. Mm -hmm. And that's a, something else I feel like that's throughout your career is you've been put in leadership positions very mm -hmm. early on to manage global teams. So what advice would you have for our listeners today who are wanting to maybe move into a leadership role and have not yet had that opportunity or for those that want to get better at mm -hmm. managing people? Very, very, very different skill set than being an individual contributor. It, it is. <laughs> um, it very much is. And yeah, you have to be mentally and physically and emotionally ready for all of it. Because yeah, when you're dealing with other humans, um, you know, the coaching I would give is, do you, do you like delivering? Do you like owning? Or do you want to orchestrate and grow people? and deliver in different ways because you're de still delivering, but you're delivering through others, not your hands aren't on everything. So that's the question I would first ask um, because it's, it's different. The emotions are different. The, um, you know, the rewards different intrinsically, it's different. So I would start there. Um, and, you know, it's tough. Like you said, you know, I was fairly young. I was in my mid to late twenties when I started managing people, I was managing people that were twice my age, that had been at the company for 40 years. When the first leadership position I got as the P2P lead, 
someone walked out of the room when I was announced. I'm not working for her. Da, 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 da. I'm like, oh my gosh. He still sends me a birthday card and Christmas card every year to this day. And that was close to 20 years ago. Um, you know, so you you have to be human. Um, like you said, you know, you articulated what a good boss looks like. I mean, a good leader is human. Um, you know, you connect with the people um, and you have to connect. You have to know what's going on in the business and you need to have your people's back um, and hold them accountable. I have I always had very high standards, um, but I was an active coach. I was an active listener um, and, you know, I was human. You know, we're all growing. We're all learning um, and, you know, doing it alongside. I never viewed myself as a boss. I was part of the team. Um, I was not afraid to get my hands dirty if I needed to jump in on a project. I, I would never take over. But if someone needed help, um, they didn't view me as a threat. Like I was coming in to, you know, hijack anything. Um, I was really just there to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, curious for those who are listening live, drop a note in the comments if you have a leadership story or example or question, because I think that's a, a big decision to make in your career is do you want to stay and be an individual contributor? You can make good money and it can be a lot less stress and less work hours versus yes. pivoting into more of a leadership role, which mm -hmm. can be a lot of work. Uh, outside of your normal job, the, all that the extra work involved with managing people. So yep. I, I'm like you, I, if people come and ask my advice, I really try to get them to sit down and think about mm -hmm. what do they want their life to look like? Right. So that's important. Yep. So Jill, you did something that I think is awesome. And mm -hmm. I've not seen a lot of other leaders do this. You took something called an extended parenting leave. Mm -hmm. And would like to know why. Why did you, after having the hustle and bustle in this big corporate career, decide to, to say bye to corporate for a while? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's something that um, I had been praying about. We had children, my husband and I were married for over 10 years um, before we had our son. Um, so we were, you know, older parents. Um, I think everyone's life changed, um, you know, during COVID, whether um, good or bad. Um, and I, I view everything as an opportunity. And, um, you know, we learn from it. And, you know, how you um, capitalize on it is different for everyone. But, you know, the company I was working for at the time was going through a lot of M&A activity. Anyone in procurement that has gone through that, it is long hours. And I had people reporting to me all over the world. Um, my son would get up in the morning. I would be on my computer on calls. He would go to bed. I would be on my computer on calls. And he, you know, from the mouths of babes, he came in and he's like, mommy, aren't you tired of working all the time? And I was like, I slammed that computer. I said, yes, I am. That was the nail in the coffin for me. <laughs> um, so to say, because there is so much more to life. Um, and I'm grateful again, we talked about some of the lessons, but, um, we were in a position, um, financially that I don't live, I'm, I don't live paycheck to paycheck. I, I never have from the time I've had my first job. Um, so I said, I, you know, I had this child for a reason. I need to be present, um, with him and for him, um, and, you know, not be distracted and stressed, um, as all of us know that, um, many of these jobs come with if, you know, they'll, they'll take as much as you're willing to give. Um, so that's really kind of what spurred it. And, you know, my husband and I, we've been entrepreneurs. So when I um, was in the, the corporate world um, and I was in the business development role at Lilly at the time, but we opened a couple of Sky Zone indoor trampoline park. So, you know, I wasn't afraid to kind of leave um, the quote unquote corporate world. Um, it was just a matter of timing. Um, and my son, you know, he he pulled that thread and thank God he did because he was right. <laughs> it was time. Kids are wise beyond their years. Yes. Yep. He is. <laughs> 
So you you and your husband have kind of been serial entrepreneurs, and even mm-hmm. when you were working in corporate. Now, mm-hmm. if I'm correct, I think you have three companies mm-hmm. um, that you're working on. So mm-hmm. maybe talk, p- pick one or two of them and mm-hmm. just kind of talk about what you're doing and why. And then I want to make sure we have time to talk about business fierce, because I think that's really interesting for this audience, given yep. it's in the procurement space, but has a different twist. Sure. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I'll. Freedom Warehousing and Solutions is a uh, certified woman-owned business, 3PL. Um, We've got space all over the U.S. Um, I have a business partner that um, has been doing this for quite some time. And, um, yeah, I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. And, you know, we've got, we employ, you know, veterans um, and we have longstanding, um, you know, employment relationships. So, were um, not one that has a lot of turnover, which is very beneficial to our clients. Um, and then we have a cryotherapy business. Um, you know, it was my husband and his friend's idea. You know, when you're in, in kind of the entrepreneurial mindset, you're always kind of throwing around ideas. And if no one knows what cryotherapy is, you you get in a tank, you don't get wet. Um, I know there's a lot of these cold plunges that people talk about, but um, it's where you, you get in three minutes um, and you spin around so you don't get burned literally um, by the liquid nitrogen. And it helps with inflammation, autoimmune disorders, you know, anxiety, depression, muscle recovery. Um, so it's very impactful and um, it's it's been interesting. I never heard, heard of it until he told me this is what we were gonna do, so. <laughs> And then your third business Mm -hmm. is called Business Fierce, Mm -hmm. and this still is in the supply chain and procurement space, and I think was inspired by you having the experience of so many salespeople trying to sell to you throughout your career Mm -hmm. and did a really bad job at it. And (laughs) you were like, wow, this is there's so many things that salespeople could do differently and better. Mm -hmm to yep. get their solution noticed by procurement practitioners. And it's funny, when I was prepping for our interview, Monday, I had a, a sales rep who's new to manufacturing ping me on LinkedIn and say, would you be willing to speak with me? I cannot figure out how to sell into procurement practitioners. He goes, it's just so hard. He goes, this is the hardest space I've ever been in. And I thought, wow, this is interesting timing. <laughs> He's reaching out and I, I have Jill coming on the show. So maybe yeah. talk a little bit about why the business and what problem you are looking to solve or help mm-hmm. people with. Yep, for sure. Um, yeah, so have him give me a call. <laughs> um, yeah, so for the last four plus years, um, as you mentioned, you know, I identified a gap. Um, I've worked with suppliers for a very long time, sat on the other side of the table. And what I noticed, it wasn't necessarily that they were bad at what they did, but every salesperson you could pick from a mile away. They all have the same approach. They all have the same tactics. Usually they all have kind of the same talking points. And what I saw, they don't understand procurement. They don't respect the process. Oftentimes they would work around procurement. So I I thought to myself, why I can help them because I know procurement and I understand business and, you know, my, we've been entrepreneurs. So I kind of understand the big picture and how all the pieces connect. Um, so a lot of once I kind of launched Business Fierce and I, I bought the domain quite a while before I started doing this um, because I wanted to make businesses fierce. Um, And, you know, like I mentioned, my tagline is you don't get what you don't ask for, but you you still need to do your research. You still need to prepare. Um, So it's about bridging the gap between, you know, sales and procurement um, and making sales savvy um, so they can speak procurement's language. So they understand what questions to ask. Um, they don't become impatient because per- the procurement process can take time. Um, I help them, you know, more effectively respond to, you know, RFPs um, rather than just kind of cookie cutter responses. Um, so really, you know, 
leveling up, whether it's a, you know, a product or a service that they're selling um, and, and do it in a way that is strategic um, and value focused. One tip that you could share today, if we have any salespeople mm -hmm. on the call that want to do a better job of selling into procurement. Ask questions, um, you know, get to know the procurement person um, you know, rather than just kind of trying to pitch all the time. Um, procurement loves to talk. Um, they're stretched too thin and um, allow them to talk. Um, so, you know, ask some open ended questions um, that will help you be better at what you do. Biggest aha moment that you've had when you've been coaching sales teams. Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they're human um, and they've been they've been rewarded for what they've done. Right. So salespeople are very well paid um, and, you know, and being human, they don't like to change. Um, so my biggest aha, aha moment is, you know, connecting with them in a way that OK, this is going to help me. This is going to, you know, make my navigation easier, better um, and also helping them understand that procurement's not the enemy. Um, they're not the ones that are, you know, putting up the stop gap, um, that are slowing things down. So, you know, understanding how the pieces connect and how procurement's incentivized is, is really critical. We have Dennis Cristiano in the mm -hmm. audience, and he says, be yourself, do not sound scripted, mm -hmm. and get to know the customer. Yep. yep. All right. So, Jill, it's time for our Spitfire round. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a few questions, mm -hmm. and I'd like to have you respond with the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Okay. Accomplishment you are most proud of? My family. Quality you admire most in yourself? Tenacity. What are you binging? What am I binging? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not watching anything right now. I'm reading right now. Um, so. If anyone in the audience needs a binge, I recommend Lessons in Chemistry. Mm -hmm. It's a eight episode show about one of the first female chemists in the United mm -hmm. States. And it's a incredible story about her journey and struggle of being mm -hmm. a woman in a very, very male dominated field. Mm -hmm. What's your dream? Oh, my dream. Um, to play golf and walk the beach every day. <laughs> I'll join you on the beach part. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve? Oh. Let's say I'm not going to be politically correct, Sarah, but idiots. The lack of common sense grinds my axe and it's growing, sadly. <laughs> Favorite thing to do in your downtime? Oh, take a walk, hang out with my family. And bucket list item you plan to check off this year? Um, we're going to, my family and I are going to Hawaii. I love that for you. Lots of beach and golf time there. Yep. Yep. All right. Our interview mm -hmm. has come to the end of the hour. I want to give a big thank you to Jill for coming on our show and being very open and honest and vulnerable. If you are not yet following her on LinkedIn, I would recommend doing that. Uh, reach out, send her a note, let her know that you listened to the interview today. Yeah. She's got a really interesting mm -hmm. business. Um, if you're looking to help uh, your team uh, mm -hmm. or someone that you know do a better job of messaging and selling into procurement, Jill is a great resource for that. And for those of you that tune into our show every single month, we have our next guest coming on on March 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And with that, I will wish everyone a wonderful afternoon.